Jesus Christ, right there. <clears throat> All righty. Mm -hmm. oh, you today? Sorry, I'm very tired. I got up like less than an hour ago. Uh, yo, Mori, how you doing today? I hope you're doing good. I'm tired. Like I just said, I I got up like less than an hour ago. <sighs> Sleepy time. I I hope everyone's doing good. Get another sip of water. Mm. <clears throat> I'm just going to blow my nose real quick in one second. All right, sorry about that. I actually remembered to post the link in on the iPlus Discord this time. <clears throat> okay, okay. <laughs> All right, so this dev stream is going to uh, primarily focus on. Stage objects. So the different types of stage objects that exist inside of a stage and inside the uh, framework. So I've moved the player start over here to this empty space so that way we don't have to, uh, I got plenty of room to mess with all this stuff. <clears throat> my sonic over here so a majority of the stage objects exist inside of this objects folder in colorful combat there are going to be a couple of stage objects that do not exist in this folder uh, i believe if i remember right in colorful combat update inside of the vital bps is where the spline objects exist so these splines here I believe they exist in the vital BPs folder uh, in the colorful combat update. Um, but in this update, where my player start go? Oh, there it is. Uh, in the next coming update, it has been moved over to the, where is it? The objects folder. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, BP spline path, uh, spline path right here. I think I believe it's called BP spline path in Colorful Combat as well. Uh, but this is where it will exist in future updates. But I believe in Colorful Combat, this here exists in the vital BPs. Um, some of the objects exist in a new folder or a new objects folder, which 
we will be moving out. We're going to be getting rid of this folder and it'll just all be located in this one folder. Uh, we created this one to different the objects that were different from infinity plus to vanilla infinity. However, we kind of were just inconsistent with it. Also, vanilla infinity had like six stage objects and that count has gone up significantly. So yeah, um, that's that's not the case anymore. So we're probably just going to move it on to one folder and be like, all right, here's all the stage objects. The British man has returned. Yeah. There are, are a couple of folders here with individual assets uh, for the most part. Uh, you don't need to worry about these. The only one you do need to worry about is the grind rail, uh, which we will probably be moving out of its folder. Um, all of these folders up here primarily just contain assets. That That's really it, like meshes and stuff like that. We'll be putting these all in a separate folder it's called like assets, like, hey, this folder is assets, and inside of the folder are folders containing assets for individual items, which we need to like centralize. We need to find all of the assets for all of these objects. I've here. been, I've actually been slowly working on that. Yeah, we need I've to been going over some of the folders, and like inside of the folder, you'll find textures, materials, audio, meshes, just anything to do with the specific item are all going to be moved into one folder. Yeah, all of these folders here are going to be moved into this folder here for assets. They're, they just haven't yet. Uh, so whenever it comes to stage objects, you don't have to worry about all these individual things um, unless you want to create your own stage ob uh, stage object and stuff like, and like you want a place to put your assets and stuff like that. Just to keep things clean. How's it going today, Jim? I hope you're uh, having a good day today. I'm tired. That's how I'm doing. All right, so to actually use the stage object, all of the stage objects in Unreal Engine are, or not Unreal Engine, in I plus are blueprints. So you simply just grab the blueprint and you drag it out. That's how you, that's how you bring a stage object into your level. <clears throat> it's, it's that simple. You just find what you need and pull it out. That's it. Huh. Ring drop actor is very large. Never noticed that. Uh, to edit the details of a stage object, after you have pulled it out, you go to the right and into your details panel is where all of the properties of that object is. So if I were to copy and paste this here, we have two different instances of the dash ramp. However, this one is going to be a trick ramp. I have edited the instance editable variables over here on the right. And now this one is different than this one in this instance. If I were to open up the blueprint, there's a bunch of variables over here on the left and stuff like that. Uh, changing these will change the defaults. If you don't have this little eye icon right here open, that that means the variable will not be instance editable meaning if you change like this variable we'll see the same across all of the objects which if you know anything about unreal engine that's pretty obvious like this here this object type it's a dash ramp it's considered a dash ramp this is information that gets passed into the uh, master character that way whenever you overlap with the dash ramp the master character understands what actor it's overlapping with or what type of actor it's overlapping with and it can go oh this is a dash ramp well if this is a dash ramp i want to cancel these specific types of abilities and things like that uh, this doesn't need to be instance editable because a dash ramp will always be a dash ramp if i were to make this instance editable like so then compiling i can change it to make this a swing pole now whenever the character or master character overlaps with it it thinks hey i'm overlapping with a spring pole uh that's it'll still do all the same physical properties of the dash ramp it will still launch you like how the dash ramp is supposed to launch you because it will still run through that type of code however your abilities and stuff will not be properly uh reset and things like that because each stage object interacts with abilities differently and that's primarily what this variable does but that's the reason why it's not instance editable 
we don't want this object to be instant or this item to be instance editable because uh, it contains information that should be the same throughout every instance of this object. So that's how you would go about editing things over here on the right. If there's something on the right here, or if there's a certain property of the actor that you want changed, and that property is not a variable on the right, it's either one, something that uh, doesn't exist, as in what you want done with this actor probably hasn't been created yet, in which case you have to do it yourself, or Two, you'll have to go into the blueprint and change it yourself in the code, which will take a lot more work than simply editing a property outside of here. Uh, so those are some things you have to keep in mind whenever it comes to editing or adding and editing stage objects and stuff like that. Uh, so you have to keep in mind that <clears throat> you may have to physically edit the code of the blueprint if you want certain things to be changed about certain properties uh, of that actor something there's a lot of things that are already editable um, we've tried to make them very very flexible in terms of uh, what you can and can't do with them um, but at the end of the day if you want an actor to do something specific then you have to either create a new version of it yourself or to uh, edit the one that exists and uh, change its properties so let's go through and um let's go through each stage object so we have the ring here it's a ring shocker uh this blueprint has to exist for one reason uh this blueprint primarily acts as a child blueprint um, there are a couple of actors, I guess I could go over this as well, there's a couple actors inside of the framework that are child actors and are parent actors. I should probably, we should probably rename this like BP underscore ring child or something like that. Um, <clears throat> if I were to pull out a ring spline, or if I were to pull out a ring circle here, you can see that it's a whole bunch of rings. Well, how did the rings get set up like this? Well, for the ring spline, it's because the ring spline is not actually a whole bunch of rings the ring spline is a spline that's all it is the ring spline actor is simply just a spline component however this blueprint has been told specifically to spawn a bunch of ring actors along its uh along the length of the spine you can see right here add child actor component so it literally inside of the construction script which is what it uh, dictates how things look outside of um, into the editor and stuff like that. Uh, it is being told for every amount of ring that exists inside of this variable, so whatever number this is, minus one, it will create that many child actor components along the length of the spline. It will also set them as individual uh, items inside of an array that it can track. <clears throat> so whenever I pulled out this ring spline actor, what it did is it said, hey, here's a spline, but my construction script says I should spawn a bunch of rings along this spline. So it did. I pulled out this spline. The spline has a default length of this right here, and the construction script said, all right, let me spawn a bunch of rings along this spline. And these rings have the exact same property as this ring right here. If I were to collect this ring, it would be the same as if I collected these rings. It literally said, hey, let me take this child actor and make a bunch of copies of it and spawn it along or spawn it along the spline. That's all it did. The same thing with this here, only instead of it being a spline, it's being spawned in a circle, which I don't believe it uses a spline. It kind of just spawns them along a radius is what it does uh, with a center point. <clears throat> so if you're putting spline or if you're putting rings in your stage you're going to either want to do what do one of uh three things you gotta decide where you want your rings you gotta decide uh what you want your rings to be doing and from there you can decide which type of ring you want to do um 
the whole reason I was explaining the child actor and things like that is because there's a couple other actors inside of uh, the engine that use uh, the same functionality as uh, like a parent object spawning in a child object. Um, <clears throat> and the nice thing about both the spline and the circle that you saw earlier is if you like it contains all the same properties that you would see inside of a child. Uh, we've set it up so that if you change any of these properties it would be as if you were changing any of these properties inside of the individual child uh, the, sp uh, the spline just goes through and sets all of the information in all of the children <clears throat> uh, so let's get into the spline or the spline specifically this is what you're most likely going to be using um, if you are planning on setting down a trail of rings anywhere uh, you have two options you can either spawn a bunch of or pull out a bunch of rings individually and place them one at a time which is an extremely slow process or you can pull out a ring spline set the spline point where you want or however many spline points that you want like so and simply state how many rings you want in the spline like so <clears throat> so this amount of rings is specific to the ring spline component because it tells the spline how many rings it wants inside of the spline. Um, <clears throat> pretty obvious. There is also is respawn rings. You can turn the it's off by default, but if you turn it on, it will respawn the rings at a set amount of time dictated by this ring spawn timer. So if I set these rings to respawn after three seconds and I then collect them. One, two, three, they're respawning now. However, if I turn that off, it doesn't matter what this variable is set to because they're not going to respawn. One, two, three, they're still gone. Uh, pretty obvious. Um, is give energy. You can tell rings to give boost energy, wisp energy, uh, any type of energy you want. So if I'm sitting here, you're going to boost around. And I collected these rings, I gained some boost energy back. Uh, how much energy they give can be dictated down here. So they could also give five energy per ring. So if I collected it, I got way more energy that time. That's because each ring is worth uh, more boost energy. Uh, light speed dash. Without that on, you were unable to light speed dash across the trail of rings. Uh, so if I turn that off and I came up here and I pressed the light speed dash button, nothing's going to happen. That's because they are not set to be light speed dash rings. You have to have that light speed dash variable on in order to light speed dash. Some of these functionalities may not exist inside of the um, colorful combat update. Uh, <clears throat> if you see a stage object, if I go over stage object and either one, the stage object doesn't exist yet, in which case there's nothing you can do, or two, some of the properties of the stage object are different, um, you can mention it uh, in chat and I will look at it real quick and explain any differences uh, to help make it make more sense. Um, there is no shield attraction and no boost attraction. By default, rings can be attracted by the electric shield as well as the boost. So if I boost next to them, I have collected them. I didn't touch the rings. I simply just boosted next to them. I'll show you how to respawn. Respawn time to three. Uh, if I turn that off, or I turn that on, meaning it should no longer be attracted by the boost, if I boost next to them, I do not attract them. One thing that we will probably end up doing that can also be changed is the radius. Um, being able to change the boost radius. Because that's what this outer cone is. This is a boost radius cone. If I turn this back on. If I boost next to them, I'm going to collect them as long as uh, any of my components 
overlap with the rings. So if I boost like this far away, I'm not going to collect the rings. I'm too far. But if I boost closer with the inside of the boost cone or the boost radius, I'm going to hit them because that's what this outer radius is. It's the boost radius. It's al It also acts as the um, uh, shield radius as well. So we could probably make that two separate components, like have a radius for the electric shield and then have a radius for the boost. Um, would not be super difficult to do. But by taking either of these on, you disable the ability to either attract them with the lightning shield or attract them with the boost. Uh, obviously, ring count dictates how much each ring is worth. So there are 10 rings here, and if each ring is worth one ring, I should be getting 10 rings. However, if I change that ring count amount and I collect all these rings, suddenly I have 20 rings. That's because each ring is worth double because I changed how much each ring was worth. Um, <clears throat> I had 20 rings there. If I change it back to one, I'm going to get one ring. Like so. Wonder. But yeah. You can also change how much rings are worth. Um, if you're going to do this, I would probably suggest just changing the default variable across all rings. If you want to change the default amount of how much rings are worth, I would personally just open up the ring as well as like the ring spline and changing this default variable to something else. That's probably what I would do. But if you simply just want to change a specific ring or a set of, set of rings, you could change it right here. Now, instead of getting a thousand points, I would be getting 50 or 5,000 points. <clears throat> uh, that's pretty much it for the ring spline. Um, the only other thing you should know is how to use a fucking spline. If uh, you have not looked up Unreal Engine tutorials on splines, I highly suggest you do so. Uh, splines are very, very, very useful whenever you want to create either a trail of something or a uh, like a path of something. Splines are really good for pathing as well as creating trails of things. Uh, you can, if I select this here, I can't change the properties of the spline until I go and I select the specific spline node, which is right here. There are currently two spline nodes, spline node zero and then spline node one, which I have spline node one selected. Uh, I can move it around and do however I please with it. If I hold Alt, left Alt, next to the space button, and then I select this again and then move it, it's going to create a new spline point. So now there are three spline points. Spline point zero, spline point one, and then spline point two. Uh, I can also, like after you grab the first spline point, um, you can go back and grab this other one and move it however you please. Uh, generally that's because Spline point zero is almost always in the exact same location as the origin point of the actor. If I simply grab this, it looks like I have grabbed spline point zero, but I have not. If I move it, it's going to move the entire spline because I have grabbed the spline origin point. If I grab this here, uh, one way you can tell is if you grab a spline point, you can see <laughs> this right here in this line. This is known as a tangent line. Um, if I grab this here, you can see a tangent line. I have grabbed the spline point. If I move this, it's moving this specific point, not the entire mesh. Um, you can also move the tangent line itself. If you grab the points of the tangent line, you can see it changes the property of the curve as well as like how it curves, uh, the strength of the curve and what direction it curves and things like that. If you grab the spline point, so that way you can get like really detailed on how you want your splines to interact or to look, things like that. Uh, so yeah, that's that's how you set a, a uh, spline of ring actors. After you've created all the ones you want, you can just fill it out with rings, 25 rings. Uh, because the lightspeed dash now grabs every single ring in a spline and moves you along the spline, you don't actually have to set a whole lot of rings along a spline if you don't want. Um, I can technically 
light speed dash across this spline right here, even though the rings are pretty well spread apart. That is because the light speed dash does not look for any ring locations. It simply grabs all of the rings within a spline, gets its location specifically, and moves it to you. Um, the old light speed dash, what it would do is it would look for a ring and then see, hey, are there any other rings nearby within this radius? If not, I'm going to just move on, or I'm just going to cancel and let go. How's it going, Fabio? How are you doing today? That is no longer the case with the ring splines. It will simply grab every single ring inside of a spline and move you along each individual ring within the spline. Uh, so you don't have to have an exuberant amount of rings inside of a spline for the light speed dash to work. Um, you can actually have very few rings inside of a spline and it will still move you along like so. Uh, that is specifically for this next update. That does not apply to Colorful Combat. In the Colorful Combat update, I would suggest filling out your spline so that way they are relatively close to each other. This here is probably is about as close as you want them. Uh, any more than that, and they start like overlapping, and you can get some overlap issues and things like that. I wouldn't do that. I would probably try and make sure the rings are spaced out probably about like that. You could even maybe stretch it to some length that there, maybe. That there's a decent amount of rings along the spline. So, yeah. Um,. <clears throat> That is how you do ring splines. One object down. <laughs> uh, all that stuff also applies for the ring circle, by the way. Um, the only difference is the ring circle is a circle and not a spline. You can't change a lot of the properties in terms of like how it stretches. The only thing you can do is set the radius of the circle. Uh, so if I wanted this to be 3000, that is technically a circle of rings, and then I can just fill it out however I please. So let's say like there's 40 or 50, 60 rings, light speed dash. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Uh, you do have to make sure they're a little bit off the ground, um, or else the snapping code might just cancel it on you. I do think once you get above certain numbers, it, the calculations start to get a little confused on how to place that many rings. So. <clears throat> uh, we've not set up the ring circle to have the same properties as the ring spline in terms of how the light speed dash functions. Um, that's something I got to get around to, but. You know, uh, there's also this ring spline one by one. Um, we're probably just going to get rid of this. I don't really see any reason to keep this actor. It doesn't. Really I don't even remember us having this. Yeah, this is something that has existed since Vanilla Infinity. I don't really see a purpose in keeping it. If you wanted a really, really short ring like that, you could just pull out two rings like so. Ring spline does break if it's too long and has a lot of rings. E yes, um, that is with the old light speed dash. Uh, with the old light speed dash, it kind of lags itself out. the The longer the light speed dash lo uh, lasts with the with the old code, uh, the more buggy and laggy it gets. Um, that's with the old code. Remember, uh, in colorful combat, that's that's how it's going to be. With this version updated, um. I can make like a really, really, really long spline. <clears throat> make it really long and then let's put like a hundred rings in it. One hundred and eighty. Oh, yeah, I have to turn on the light speed dash. I should we should probably have that be on by default. There's like a hundred rings, super long spline. Uh, it works just fine. That's with the new light speed dash. You guys aren't gonna have that until this update comes out. Um, 
with the colorful combat update, which is the one that's currently live right now, Nao's correct. Uh, the longer your spline is and the more rings inside the spline, the more laggy and buggy the light speed dash tends to act. The light speed dash is best used within short bursts with colorful combat. Uh, in this next update, you can use it in much longer bursts if you want. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Uh, we already went over the checkpoint, so we're not going to go over that again. Here's a spike cylinder. There are no separate properties inside of the spike cylinder. Uh, you can scale it up if you want. Not sure why you would want to do that, but you can. Uh, spike panels, which do have some uh, properties. The spike panels are still unfinished. I have not gone back to fix them, uh, but you can tell them to use a timer, in which case... Oof, that's <sighs> far away. What? Uh, nothing, nothing. Oh. If they're on a timer, they will... Uh, they're supposed to activate, yeah. They'll activate over a set amount of time, like so. Uh, but you can also set them to use a detection radius, which if you overlap with the detection radius, they'll um, pop out whenever extend. you overlap with it. Yeah, they'll extend whenever you overlap with the radius. And then retract when you leave. Yes. Pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the counter rate is the counter for the timer, I believe. Um, spike timer active, how, like at what point? So this here is a rate that means it will count every second. If I were to put this to 0.5, it would count at a speed of half seconds, so it would be twice as fast, I think, if I remember right. That's that's for like yeah, then popping up and down yep. if you type uh, timer, like if you tick timer yep. it will then just go up and down on its own accord so if i put this to one uh, the timer activate is how long it takes so if that is one that means it'll take one it'll be one second per count and this here is the achieved count before it will activate so that is eight seconds that means it takes up to a count of eight in order to activate with this being a count of one per tick that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then activates. Um, <clears throat> so you're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and it should you activate. Need to the boolean. I had turned it off, didn't I? Fuck. Yes. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, yeah, it'll activate a little bit earlier, but that's whenever it plays its animation. But then the animation finishes on that eighth second. Um, if I were to bump this down to 0.5, I believe it would go faster. So it should uh, either do it at four seconds, yeah, four seconds. See, it counted twice as fast because 0.5 is half of one, meaning it ticks at a much faster rate, being half a second. Uh, this should be like tick rate, not counter rate. Uh, the uptime is just how long it lasts, 3.5. I believe that also counts for the tick rate. Uh, same thing. So if it's 0.5, that's going to be more like 1.75 seconds. Um, the spike pop-up speed is how long it takes to pop up after it initially starts. So that little initials uh, pop-out versus the full pop-out. I think that I believe that's what that uh, counts. And then there's the knockback, meaning how far you get knocked back if you take a hit. So if I put a ring here, uh, put this on use timer. So now it'll activate on radius. Grab this ring, damage. You can see I get knocked back that much, but if I were to bump that up significantly, let's make that like 2000. Oh no. In theory, in theory, I should be knocked out way more, but there's also a chance this hasn't been updated with the damage code, so... Yeah, it hasn't been updated with the damage code yet. Uh, but in the future, it, that's what that will do. 
that's pretty much it with the spike panel. Pretty self-explanatory. Not a whole lot to go over. Um, <clears throat> dash panel. Dash panels are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, there are some like niche things here and there. Uh, there's the dash power, which by default is set to 10,000 if I overlap with it. It's going to launch me out quite far away. Pretty much to the end of this uh, arrow. That's not always going to be accurate, um, but this time it did. If I bump this down to like 5,000, you can see the arrow has shrunk quite a bit. If I overlap with it. And that's without me pressing any buttons, by the way. Like, I overlap with it and I immediately let go of the input. You can see I didn't stop exactly near the end of the arrow, but I stopped a lot closer. If I drop this down to 1,000, I'm not going to go hardly anywhere. I'll go forward a little bit, but that's about it. Just like that. So this does scale quite a bit uh, exponentially. Um, the input delay is what it sounds like. How long before I can start moving it again after I've been launched? It's set to 0.70 by default, so less than a second. Now, if I overlap with it, I'm going to hold uh, the right button. And, like, as I overlap with it, I'm going to hold down the right key, meaning I'm trying to move right, but I will not be able to, and the input delay goes away. And now I'm moving right. That's how long the input delay lasts. If I were to increase it to, like, two seconds, even if I hold forward after my launch is gone, um, I will not be able to move because it then disables all input. So you can see I basically almost came to a stop because even though I was holding forward, my input delay was set to be like two seconds. If I set it to three seconds, I overlap with it. Obviously, I'm going to pretty much come to a complete stop and then I can move because it disabled my input. Pretty self-explanatory. Um, is restricted dash panel. I believe if you turn that off, it doesn't activate the input delay. Yeah, I can move almost immediately as soon as my uh, angular momentum overrides my forward momentum, I'm able to move. But I've got a lot of forward momentum, so it takes a little bit for my angular momentum to overcome it. <clears throat> uh, so if I turn that back on, and I bump this down to like 5,000 again, I can move almost immediately. It simply just kind of redirects my uh, direction. As you can see, like it, it didn't really like, f uh, it, it forced me to go in a direction, but it didn't like completely override all my inputs and stuff like that. So that's what that does. Uh, there is reset camera on dash by default. That is on because you're going to want to know where you're being dashed to. Uh, so if I hit this, my camera is forcibly pulled behind me. If I turn that off, pretty self-explanatory, it will not reset my dash or my camera. So if I overlap with this, bam, camera's not been reset. Uh, is remove wisp. If a wisp can overlap with it, it will, to my knowledge, I don't think it'll, I think it will also remove it from your inventory. I could be wrong. So if I have a wisp in my inventory, but yeah, no, that's what I thought. Um, if, if remove wisp is on, if a wisp by default can not, or can overlap with it, it will disable it. So. Uh, wisps don't always have the same interaction with panels like this here. Uh, sometimes they interact with it just fine. Sometimes they don't depending on the type of wisp. If I have remove wisp on, I transform, First. it will disable my wisp. It's supposed to also launch me, but the timing and the overlap doesn't properly uh, function at the moment. So that's pretty much it for this year. Uh, some wisps, keep in mind when it comes to stage objects, um, some wisps are pre-programmed to auto disable upon overlap. Uh, so even if you have remove wisp off, there are some wisps that will simply just turn off after you've overlapped with it. That's because the stage object, like the wisp couldn't properly interact with the stage object in any way. Um, 
So having the Wisp overlap with the Stage object wouldn't really matter. Uh, so it kind of just disables. I believe if I were to overlap with a Spring, with I think Drill is told to disable. Drill! Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, so remove wisp was off right here meaning if the wisp could overlap it should so uh red burst can overlap with springs oh, or at least it's supposed to be able to uh what's another wisp i think spike can spike should be able to overlap with uh springs spike! no that's weird i'll have to go in and check that uh certain wisps can overlap with certain stage objects but certain stage objects will also override that and be like hey or certain wisps will override that and be like hey there's no reason i should be able to overlap with this um even if i did i couldn't do anything so i'm going to disable and instead pass those properties on to sonic and or the player character and the player character will do it anyway uh let's see here we did the dash panel we could also do dash ramps real quick Dash ramps, dash panels. The, the, the nice thing about dash ramps, dash panels, and the springs as well as the dash rings is they all use the same properties. Uh, whenever we, whenever I go over the dash ramps here, a lot of that's going to apply to springs as well as dash rings. So going over that rings and uh, springs are going to be pretty easy. Uh, if you have the pre-calculated set to off, it, the dash ramps will use these variables here for power and up power um regardless it'll also use input delay it doesn't really matter uh even if you have pre-calculated on it'll use the input delay variable um, but forward power and up power are going to be used in place of the pre-calculated destination let me go ahead and grab the pre-calculated destination and pull it out here that way it's out of the way but uh, if I overlap with it, it's not going to send me over any specific arc. It's just going to launch me based on the preset variables. So if I bump this up to forward power to 4,000. I went forward a little bit more. I think I can just... Yeah, I should be able to just set these. If I did this here, up power... Yeah, you can see it sent me way higher that time. <clears throat> if I put that back to 2,000. I hardly went forward, but I went up really high. So yeah, that's what these here use. Um, if I change this to a pre-calculated spring, uh, it's going to completely ignore the up power. So if I put this up power to something really, really high like so, uh, it's going to completely ignore that. It's going to instead try and launch me to this launch destination. <clears throat> what it will try to do, if I press this draw debug button, it's going to try and follow this arc, is what it's going to try and do. So this arc, I've explained this before many times in the past, but we're going to do it again anyway. Um, this arc has can be used to determine quite a few things. This yellow dot is your destination. Oh, God damn it. Stop it. Stop. What's going on? There we go. This yellow dot right here is your launch destination. If this yellow dot is not lined up with this diamond, there's probably something wrong. Uh, that can happen if you rotate the object on its pitch or yaw and it could also happen if you scale the object so trying not to mess with the scale too much um we're gonna try and figure out how to fix the problem with rotating the objects but for now i would suggest not messing with the scale too much as it can mess with the calculations um the blue dot represents where you where the arc will end so if i were to uh Let's let's stop right here. Um, draw, draw debug. Come on. Uh, 
pretty calculated. Draw debug. Let's place a single ring. Uh, right up here next to where this ends. Oop, oop, like so, that way you can see. If I overlap with this, by the time I collect that ring, I will have control over my character again. As you can see right there. So that's what that blue dot represents, is when you will regain control of your character. If you want the character to end up at the launch destination specifically, you will have to increase this input delay. Let's increase it by a whole second, or by half a second. <clears throat> and you will see it's now suddenly closer to your launch destination. You kind of got to fiddle with this number until it gets much closer to where you want it. That's too far. Got to bring it back. 1.3. <clears throat> That's about, about as accurate as you're going to get. If I put it to 1.2, it's going to pull back a little bit. So now it's there. So 1.3, or you could also put 1.25 if you want to get super, super precise. <laughs> So now my arc has been altered again. Let's see here, let's pull out a ring. Right about here. Oop. Let's draw the debug. Right there. You can see this time I have, I will collect the ring. Or actually, no, I didn't collect it. Not lined up properly. There we go. Now I'll collect the ring because the, the destination is set to the same location as the ring and the arc now properly follows it. I've collected the ring. <clears throat> so if you need to use this, by the way, this also applies for springs and this also applies for dash rings. If you're planning on pre using this pre-calculated situation or this pre-calculated feature, use this debug tool. This will help you a lot. This will tell you exactly what kind of arc the character will use and things of the such. Uh, if you want to change how long the debug stays on for, you can edit this here. This number will decide, hey, now this is going to stay on screen for 10 seconds. If you need that information for whatever reason, even if I clicked away, that's going to stay on for about 10 seconds. I can now maybe line stuff up along it if I want. Uh, do what you need with it. Uh, the ramp arc here. Uh, the ramp arc, the smaller the number here, the sharper the arc. So if I were to draw a debug, you can see I'm going to go way up there versus the bigger the number. I'm sorry, the, the smaller number, the steeper the arc. Or, um, yeah, the higher the number, the more shallow the arc. So if I, if I pop this back here, you can see by default it's 5. It has a nice, decent arc here. But if I went up to point 7, it's going to have a much shallower arc. Uh, the maximum is not a point 0.99 because you can't go above 1. If you go above 1, it will... Uh, it'll do shit like that. Like, point 0.99 is even that, like too much um another thing you have to keep in mind is the more shallow the arc the faster you will move for, to your destination so as you can see the endpoint is way out there that is because the arc is super shallow i have to move this down significantly like 0.2 yeah even 0.2 is not enough 0 0.1 0 0.1 if i were to overlap it with 0.1 Let's pop this back down to five seconds. <clears throat> I draw debug. I'm going to shoot more directly towards it, but I'm also going to be moving much faster, like so. That's why you don't want a super shallow arc. <clears throat> you definitely want an arc more akin to like 0.8 even might be a little. That looks like it's super, super short, but it will still launch me pretty quickly, like so. And technically, I still reached the, uh, I still reached the destination. Like, that launch still shot me towards the destination. It's just, it was such a powerful one, or powerful launch that, you know. 
kind of hard to tell. Uh, again, if you bring it down, let's bring it down to like point, point 0.2, draw the debug, you can see it's going to shoot me way up into the air. If I increase this to like two seconds, you can see even after two seconds, it's still not going to be enough. Three seconds, too much, 2.5, right about right. It's going to shoot me up into the air, much slower, mind you. So you can see I took like a much wider arc. Whee! Much more akin to what this uh, predicted. Um, <clears throat> with the trick ramp, obviously all it does is change the aesthetic. Trick ramps don't actually do anything. If I overlap with it, I'll just do a little trick. Woohoo! That's about it. Um, <clears throat> that's about it for the trick ramp. Uh, like I said, this forward power and this up power will not do anything as long as it is in pre-calculated mode. If I turn this off, this arrow will turn back on and it will now go into base mode <laughs> or force mode. Or the force mode is probably a better name for it because it will simply just launch you at a specific force rather than at a specific arc. Um, the input delay will still take into effect regardless. Uh, all of that stuff also applies to springs. Springs have the exact same functionality. Um, what's most important about springs, I mentioned this earlier with the dash ramp, uh, you can change an actor's... Uh, what is it? Uh... Yaw rotation? What is the Z rotation? The Z is yaw, right? Um, yeah. Yes. You, Whenever you're using the pre-calculated code, do not change an object's roll or pitch. If you do so, and I did the draw debug, or actually, let me turn on the pre-calculated. You can see it's not going anywhere near my launch destination. That's because um, the calculations don't take your uh, take the actor's rotation into account very well. Pre-calculated. So if you're going to use these springs and you're going to use a pre-calculated information, don't change the rotation. Hopefully we can maybe get this fixed by the time this update is out, but in the case of Colorful Compat, do not, do not change an object's uh, pitch or roll. Like this here is the roll. This here is the pitch. You can change an, an object's yaw, like this here, if I were to draw the debug, it still works. Um, don't worry about changing the yaw, that should work fine. But don't pay, change the pitch or the roll. Um, springs have an additional type of setting. If I were to pull out a uh, dash ramp, and if I were to pull out a dash ring right here, you can see they simply have a boolean that says is pre-calculated on or off. Uh, springs actually have three settings. Uh, it's located right here. Spring launch type. This is the type of launch it will do. There's a pre-calculated, which will launch you towards your pre-calculated destination. Boing, like so. There is basic. I don't know why it disappeared. It should, in theory, still work. Did not. Okay, I don't know why I did that. Uh, there is basic, which is simply just launch me upward based on the uh, launch information. So if the launch power is 4,000, it will launch me higher. Boing, like so. Uh, and then there is uh, momentum. Momentum will still launch me based on my launch power. Boing, like so. However, it will not override moment my momentum. So if I boost into it, I will launch forward. And spring, like so. However, if I were to set this to basic, it will override my movement and it will launch me forward. Uh, it'll also disable my boost. Like so. <clears throat> so if you want a momentum spring, it'll be there. Uh, 
I believe in Colorful Combat, it is not set to an enum. Um, I believe they are set to booleans. I could be wrong. In the Colorful Combat update, there'll be a boolean that says, like, pre-calculated. Like, is pre-calculated or is momentum. In the Colorful Combat update, I believe is pre-calculated overwrites all of them. So if you have the is pre-calculated boolean on, it will not matter if you have the is momentum on because the pre-calculated will overwrite it. If you have the pre-calculated off the momentum variable will then dictate the properties of the spring. If you have that off, it'll be a basic spring. If you have it on, it'll be a momentum spring. I believe. Um, we also have the uh, mesh type. You can have four different types of meshes. Standard spring, the wide spring. The wide spring is the same as a standard spring. It just has a wider hitbox. Boing. Boing, like so. Uh, there's the air spring, which has the same hitbox as the basic spring, but it also plays a little sound. Um, technically the springs do not have physics, so, uh, you can, you could place any spring anywhere. Like you can put a, a, um, a basic spring up in it, like in midair if you want. It wouldn't look very good, but you could do it. Uh, you can do the same thing with the wide spring. God damn it. Uh, the main reason why you would want the air spring is it just aesthetically looks nicer. And it also plays a sound. Like, if you get close enough, you can actually hear the spring or spring fan going. Boing. Uh, and the last one being the Eggman spring. Um, the Eggman spring does not have any, like, you know, specific properties. It just simply plays a sound. It, it acts like any other spring. Like, it will launch me based on the same settings as all the others. The only difference is, is it plays a sound and it has a little particle that plays. So, the Eggman spring, you can use Eggman springs the same way you can use any others. It's literally a regular spring. It just looks different. It is the exact same as any other spring. Um, this right here, this is momentum spring. Uh, that simply changes the aesthetic right now. Uh, like the visual, if I were to change it to a white spring, you can see it's now a yellow spring. We're probably going to change that as well. It, I don't know. We might just rename it. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, input delay. All of this stuff, spring power, input delay, that functions the exact same way everything, like the things in the dash ring, the dash ramp does. The main difference that this has is um, there's also the restrict movement. Uh, the others don't have this as an option. Probably could have it as an option. I don't know. Um, the restrict movement does the same thing that the uh, dash panel does, where if you have restrict movement on Uh, it will not use the input delay. So if I set this to one second, I overlap with it. I can move almost immediately after. But if I have restrict movement on, it's not going to let me move until after the input delay. Which you can see there. I didn't start moving until after I reached the pinnacle of the arc. Or the apex of the arc. Uh, remove wisp functions the same way. Spring arc functions the same way. Springs, dash rings, and dash ramps are insanely similar. <clears throat> uh, same thing with dash rings. The main difference with the dash ring is um, the aesthetic stuff. There's the rainbow arc, which I think the rainbow arc, I don't remember if it does in I plus or not. Um, in vanilla infinity, the rainbow ring would refill your energy. I don't think that's the case here. Yeah, no, it doesn't. <clears throat> so, not really anything different. Uh, you'll just have to make sure you remember to reset the rotation if you want to set a ring that uses the pre-calculated um, trajectory. Uh, similarly to springs, dash ramps don't really have this because you can preset the launch arc 
or you can set the launch arc based on its uh on its variables when it comes to dash rings and springs uh the rotation matters a lot more uh, by the way all this applies to the basic launch if you have basic launch active or if you have pre-calculated off if you have that stuff off then you can do whatever you want with the rotation like you can rotate this however you want uh, you just have to remember at any point in time if you turn pre-calculated on or if you change a spring to pre-calculated mode you're going to want to make sure your pitch and your roll are default doesn't matter about the yaw it's just the pitch and roll that's all that matters and again that's only if pre-calculated is on if it's off then you can rotate these however you want and it will launch you based on the rotation but if you have a sequence of these set up which i will also show you a different way to do a sequence of these if you have a sequence of like dash rings set up and you want the last one to launch you in a very specific location you have to make sure that you set the last one's rotation to be default which you can do by simply setting that there and then setting the rule or the the y'all to be whatever you want it to be So yeah, that's basically it for these here. Those are going to be your most basic things, whatever, like your basic interactables. You got your springs, your dash ramps, dash rings, um, springs, and dash panels. Uh, let's see here. Where is it at? Uh, actor's spline. This here is a spline of actors. It's similar to a dash ring, or I'm sorry, a ring spline. Except for the fact that you can set any actor you want to be in the spline. You can set it to be 10 rings. Uh, you can set it to be balloons if you want. The main difference between this here and the ring spline is an actor, a ring spline will set a trail of rings along the spline based on the amount of points and the, the length of the spline but an actor spline will only set an object per spline point. So there are three spline points here. There are only three objects in the spline. If I were to pull out another one, you can see the default is the ring. If I were to pull this out and I pull out another point, you can see there's only three rings. So you don't want to use this in place of the ring spline more than likely. If you do, um, you're not going to have the same properties as the other ring spline. So you got to be careful with that. The main thing uh, you have to keep in mind here with the actor spline is the fact that you cannot set the individual proper or the properties of the, in the individual component inside of the spline. Um, so like if I were to set it to rings again, not ting, ring, or set it to ring, you can see I don't have the same, um, I don't have the same options to change any of the properties of those rings. I can't make them light speed dash rings. I can't make them, uh, you know, boost a non boost or non lightning shield rings. I can't do anything with those rings. All I can do is I can set an actor of rings. The reason you would want to do something like this is again for something like a balloon. You can set a, like set an actor or an, an, a, a spline of balloons out, and you can set their rotation individually, and they act like basic balloons. I can I can uh, home attack onto them. Like so, I just can't set their individual properties. So I can't set them to respawn, not respawn. I can't set what components they give me and things like that. Uh, you can also use this for dash rings. Uh, these are pretty good for dash rings. Again, the main difference being you can't set the um, individual properties of the dash rings. So you can't make the dash rings more powerful than one another, things of the such. So I cannot guarantee that I will reach from one dash ring to the next because I can't override the properties of each dash ring. So if I'm going to do that, I have to make sure I actually place the dash rings close enough to one another so that uh, they can overlap with each other. Like so. <clears throat> so that's what I was meaning where we're like, you have to make sure you keep in mind like the proper or um, what properties you have them set to or the actor set to if i wanted a dash ring that sets uh sends me to a specific location i would have to pull out a separate dash ring like so 
line it up with the other dash rings. And then I would have to set its properties to be what I want it to be. So pre-calculated, like so. <clears throat> so that that is one way you can use like the uh, actor spline in tandem with another actor and things like that. But like I said, just be careful what you do with the actor spline. You can't set any of the individual properties of the actors, it will presume that you want the default properties. So if you want to change the uh, properties of an actor in a spline, you have to change the defaults for that actor, but then in, you would also be changing the defaults for every instance of that actor. So the actor spline has very limited uses. It's not a super, super useful uh it's not a super useful component and level design, but there are instances where you may want to use it. Um, I guess we can go over some smaller ones that are super easy. The bumper. My uh, original contribution. Yeah, the bumper. This is just a simple bumper. It acts like a bumper. Oop. <laughs> Bong. <clears throat> uh, the score limit is how much score you can get or the score amount is how much score you can get per hit bonk, 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 bonk. it still has issues oh I yeah I don't know what oh the bounce score uh, I'm not sure what that is supposed to mean so your maximum amount of times ever can be hit before a score alert is no longer given I don't even think that works uh, you can set a custom bumper type like this here. This is a, I guess this is a hero's bumper. Uh, that probably doesn't need to be an enum unless you're planning on adding more types of bumper. Uh, that can probably just be. Oh a... yeah, that was like the original thing because we we're gonna make it so every item would have that option. Uh, the bumper Z power. Uh, that's just the overridden Z potential. If I were to set that to one thousand, it'd be significantly more powerful. I mean, actually hit the fucking thing. <laughs> Bonk. Oh <Yeah>. my god. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, what is it, G? No. The F. F. There we go. Uh, that's kind of just override your uh, Z. Momentum. If I set this like 5,000, it'll just launch me far away. E, like so. Bonk. So yeah, that's pretty simple. Uh, it's a bumper. Bumper does bumper things. Uh, bombs. There are three different types of bombs. There's the generation bomb, or generations bomb. There's a damage panel bomb, which is supposed to be like a mine. And then there is the Sonic DX spike ball, which is not a bomb. It's simply just a uh, spike ball. Well, let me put out a 10 ring here so I don't die. <clears throat> you can set them to explode or not explode or only damage. They simply just damage the actor if they overlap with it. Bonk, like so. Um, I think the generations bomb, we should probably say so that if it's set to a bomb, it'll auto explode. But, but yeah, you can set it to not explode if you want to. Pretty self-explanatory. Balloons. Um, oh, this, this is one other thing I kind of forgot to mention, uh, specific to the springs. Uh, the balloons have this as well, I believe. Um, the springs have a home attack disable timer, meaning if you home attack the spring, uh, you will not be able to home attack again until that timer is disabled. Uh, specifically, you won't be able to over or home attack that actor. So if I were to home attack this actor here... I cannot home attack that actor again until that timer runs out. So if I were to bump this up to like five seconds. You see, I can't home attack it again until that timer runs out. That, that's one property I kind of forgot to mention. I believe the balloons have something similar um, or not. Uh, can respawn. 
obviously they can just respawn and there's a respawn delay boop for about one second you can see boop it respawns i even like set up this unique look uh, unique little respawn sequence for it will actually respawn really really high up into the air boop. and then it floats down so if i were to bump that respawn delay to like three seconds boop. <laughs> like so you know all those balloons that get lost into the sky for carnivals and stuff? Yep. This is where they come. Yep. Uh, you can set the individual color of the balloons. Red, blue, green, yellow. I wonder if we could set this to be like a color wheel instead. I think that'd be interesting. Yeah. But I think we should Can probably do. do that instead. I'm gonna. I'm busy adding stuff to the list while we're going through. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this. Just I'm not forgetting, so I'm gonna add that as well. Uh, balloon mesh types we have a few default balloon meshes uh you have the unleashed you have the generations which the generations by the way th this uh balloon color only applies to the unleashed type if i set it to generations you can see it's gonna be three separate balloons if i set it to heroes and we could probably also have that apply to the heroes material as well i don't know if you're able to do that but maybe you can. Oh, it should be easier to do stuff like that yep uh there's also the infinity one which is not really a balloon but it's just like a little neat little aspect thing um same thing remove wisp uh respawn tolerance i don't remember what that does tolerance of respawn location interpretation uh, interpolation uh, i think that what that has to do with um because whenever a balloon respawns it respawns really high up into the air yeah and then okay yeah Ooh. no the respawn tolerance that's that's a timer um as it respawns up in the air and it moves back down to its original location uh it's not going to get that location exact because getting exact locations in unreal engine like getting two exact locations to match with an interpolation is extremely difficult um so there's a tolerance this here is a tolerance of 10 units so if this location like if this spawned in negative uh thirty thousand three hundred ninety x uh negative forty five thousand sixty y with three hundred ninety z essentially it can be ten units off of any of these whether that be a positive or negative it will not have to be exact that's what this here does if I change this to fifty um it can be up to fifty units off uh ten is generally a pretty good close location if you're 10 units off of a lo like a location or even five units is pretty close to five units off of any location is pretty close um if i remember right 10 units is one size of this square so 10 units is pretty close uh it will not be the like exact the same but it'd be pretty close uh you can change how much you get uh, bounce off of it from uh in the x y directions bonk you can also change how much you can get bounced by on the z uh, direction so if i bump this up i should be able to get launched further Boop, like so and then if i bumped this up i would get bumped up higher bonk I'm like so higher i'm gonna go higher a uh, score amount pretty significant or uh, self-explanatory sorry uh energy amount if it gives you energy uh which i think by default they do yeah probably have that be an option whether or not it wants to give you energy uh item choice so this is a nice little thing about balloons balloons can be told to give items uh so i can by default they normally give tin rings uh, if you if i overlapped with this and hit it it gave me 10 rings uh we're gonna change an option so you can tell it how many rings you want to give um but that'll be for a different thing uh you can also activate a one-up or you can do a one-up if you want essentially you can tell balloons to give any item you want so you can maybe have like a trail of balloons here copy base uh, let me change this to none and change this to none copy paste copy paste here we'll make this one be like um a heroes we'll make this one like blue this one 
yellow, but then we'll have this one give you a one up. You can do something unique like this here, where you can hop across the balloons. That was supposed to give you an extra life. I don't know why it didn't. Oh, I think I might know why. It's probably because of the mesh type. Oh, wait, no, they don't. They, currently, there's a bug where if you home attack them, it will not give you the item. Um, I don't know why. But if you home attack onto a balloon, it won't give you the item. I'm not sure why that's the case. But hopefully we'll have that figured out. Um, I, I, really, I really hope Emmanuel figures out this bug with the homing attack. I don't know what the hell it's going on with it, but it's kind of annoying. <clears throat> uh, obviously, you can tell to remove the wisp. There isn't really a whole much more to go over with the balloons. It's... A lot of its uh, properties are pretty self-explanatory. No, I don't want to autosave. Um, another simple octor we can go over. Item boxes. Uh, currently, item boxes are pretty simple. Uh, you can tell it whether or not it wants to respawn. Um, in which case, if you leave a loading volume and then come back, it will dictate whether or not they can respawn. So I'm gonna get out a lot over here. So like this here is set to respawn or not respawn. This item box here is set to not respawn, but this item box is. So let me go and just zoom on over here. You ran straight through the 2D section somehow. Uh, it doesn't stretch up that high, I don't believe. Oh. Uh, so if I were to hit this, wow. and I leave, come back, it's still destroyed. If I hit this, however, I leave, come back, it's back. That's because it's been set to respawn. Um, they are also supposed to respawn on death as well. They are not set on a respawn timer because once they're destroyed, they're destroyed. You shouldn't be able to like reset them on a timer. If you want that to be something in your game, that's something you'll have to set up for yourself. Um, I believe this might have been bugged in Colorful Combat. Uh, we did get it figured out. It is fixed now. I don't remember if we fixed it before or after Colorful Combat released. Um, you can tell it if it's set to be 10 rings, uh, which by the way, there's a down here it's set to 10 rings but we should probably just change that name to just rings uh that's what this here display ring count it'll give 10 rings um you can change how much it gives you if i set this to 50 even though it's set to 10 rings it is now set to give me 50 rings and if i hit it bam it'll give me 50 rings um you can do what's called a random ring amount which if i hit this instead of it being a 50 it'll be a question mark and whenever i hit it it'll give me a random amount of rings that random amount of rings is set here maximum ring, random ring and minimum random ring this here means uh, the maximum potential amount of rings it can give me if it's set to random and the minimum amount of rings it can give me if it's set to random so the last time i got 47 rings this time i got 24 rings um, you can change the mesh to be a modern item box. The main difference between the classic and a modern item box is a modern item box can be destroyed by simply walking into it. Side note as well, mesh has been updated. Yeah, the mesh has been updated. It looks much nicer. Uh, same thing as always, score amount, ring amount, those things are pretty self-explanatory. Energy amount, if you want it to give it in if you want it to give energy. Um you can do so by that there. Uh, the player bounce off X, Y. If you jump on it, that's how much of a, like a bounce you get off of it whenever you jump on it. Bonk. Uh, the box ID, which by the way, you don't need to worry about that there. Um, you should not be setting that. If I were to go over and find our level manager, if I hit assign item boxes, and then I go back, it should have an ID now. 28. It now has an ID of 28. Uh, if you want your 
item box to respawn, you do have to hit that button. If you do not go to your, uh, Christ, who is pinging me? Why did me. you ping me? It's for something for you to check out after the stream. Aha. Uh -huh. All right, I'll I'll look at that here in a bit. Um. <clears throat> Let's see here. What was I saying? Oh, you have to assign item box IDs if you want an item box to respawn. If you tick respawn on and it's not been assigned an ID, it will not respawn, I believe. Um, <clears throat> this level manager ref, I don't think this actually uses anything. I don't believe it exists. Um... Also, in the Colorful Combat update, I don't remember... I don't believe we actually have that auto-assign functionality in Colorful Combat. You will have to assign them manually. Uh, if it does, I would simply just check the level manager, um, see if that button exists, the assign item box IDs. I don't think it does. If I remember right, we didn't implement this functionality until before uh, Colorful Combat release, or until after Colorful Combat released, um, so you will have to set those IDs manually, but like I said, I believe in Colorful Combat it was bugged, if I remember right, Reese, like, uh, for some reason it didn't properly set the... Uh, for which one, sorry, exactly? The... I item box respawning. Like, there, there is a bug where item boxes didn't respawn properly or something like that. Um, yes, there definitely was one at one point, and I do believe that is in the Colorful Combat update. So, in Colorful Combat, don't expect the item boxes to properly respawn, even if you set the IDs. Um, but it's been fixed. Like, in this next update that we release, it's been fixed. It'll work more properly. Don't worry about it. Uh, item boxes share the same enumeration that balloons do. You can set the item box to be whatever you want. Um, side note, for things like invincibility and speed shoes, you cannot set the properties of that inside of the item box. The item box is not what decides how long this speed shoes or the invincibility lasts. That is up to the master character. We could probably change that in the future if people wanted us to, like, have the information set in the item box and then passed into the master, which wouldn't be super difficult to do. Um... If that's what people want, then we can do that. If not, um, you set that information inside the speed parent. Or, I'm sorry, in the master character, not the speed parent. Uh, how long the speed shoes last as well as how long the invincibility lasts, that's up to the master character. Not the item box. If you want it to be an item box thing, we could make it that. Um, that way you could set the timer on individual item boxes. Like, one speed shoes lasts longer than another. I don't know. I'm not sure why you would want that. Not necessarily good game design, but you know what? We do have a timer set on the item boxes, or I'm sorry, not on the item box, on, on the sp speed shoes as well as the invincibility, so you can always see how much, how long you have, so. Yes. Uh, that's about it for the item boxes. Item boxes are pretty simple. Um, hit rings. Hit rings. Don't have a lot. <laughs> Why, where, where's... Oh, there it is. It's all the way down here for some reason. Huh. Uh, okay. So hint rings uh, have this thing here and here, like hint setup. I don't know why it's not all the way up top. It's kind of just all the way down here. Kind of weird. Um, hint rings have this text. Uh, you fill this one here out, this hint text variable, and you can decide how long it stays up based on this text time. It'll follow this timer. You can also sell it to play a sound. Uh, you can also set up what's called a deactivation zone. Um, <clears throat> if I play this sound, and you can also set the volume of the sound, if you check that on, it will play whatever is in that hint clip volume. This is a hint ring. It can play audio files when activated. To change the played audio, Simply select the hint ring you wish to change in the editor window and replace the hint clip variable with the sound clip of your choice. Make So like like that said, this is the hint clip variable. Change it with whatever audio clip you want. So if you want each individual hint ring to have its own audio, you can do that. 
Um, just make sure the play sound variable is ticked on. Uh, there's also the deactivation zone. So if you don't want it set to a timer, uh, it will by default follow a timer. Um, but if you don't want it set to a timer, uh, you can also set this deactivation zone as well as the radius of the deactivation zone. So if I overlap with it and then leave the deactivation zone, it will deactivate the hint timer. Uh, and that'll also disable the audio. This is a hint ring. It can play audio files when activated. To change the played audio... So you can see, even though I haven't left, the, 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 the thing editor. went away because uh, its timer went up. It will still follow the length of the timer, so we could probably be turn that into a variable like use text timer, in which case it will not follow a timer. It will simply just wait until you exit. Um... <clears throat> That's not that's an option we could add. It really wouldn't be difficult. Uh, that's about it for the hint rings. Hint rings, like I said, super simple. Um, spring pole uh, is pretty simple. There is a base, arm, and tip strength. You can set the strength of each component. You can see there's three hitboxes here. There's the base, the arm, and the tip. Depending on where you land on it, it will launch you at a different height. And you can set what that is based on these variables. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I guess I could do a an example. If I set this to like 4,000, set this to 3,000, you'll be able to see the difference in the strength of the spring poles like much more clearly. That's the base. That there is the arm. And that is the tip. You can see just how much higher I am sent on the tip versus on the arm. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, red rings. Let me go over this real quick. Currently, right now, I think you can have as many red rings in a level as you want. However, the UI is not set up for that. I don't know if we can even set it up for that. Um, which one, sorry? Red rings. Like red star rings. The UI. Like, the UI has a little thing that pops up and has, like, five red rings on it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, um, technically, there's nothing limiting how many red rings you have in a level. That is true. That could actually be something. I'm going to add that to the list as maybe an optional thing, because that could be something neat to do. Yeah. Uh, um, well, we'll consider and probably try to work on the idea of, like, having as many red rings as you want to be added to the level. Um, all you need to know about red rings is if you set down a red ring, you got to add, add an index, which is something we can probably add to the level manager. Uh, simply set your red rings down and have the level manager do it. Uh, we'll still have the option to do it manually because the red ring that you collect correlates to the red ring that shows up on the um, UI. So as you saw earlier, this first red ring on the far left is red ring zero. If I collect it, it will be the very first red ring on the far left of the UI here. But if I collect this red ring over here, it'll be on the right side because that was red ring number five. So where you want your rings in the level to be, like if you want your red rings to progress uh, throughout the level and also correlate with the UI, you'll have to make sure you set them as such, zero being the first one. Phi, or number four being the last one. Um, I cannot guarantee that if we if we uh, create a functionality in the level manager, I can't guarantee that it will do that. Um, probably not. I don't know how the level manager goes about getting all the actor in what order. It will simply just assign them in whatever order it finds, I think. It, like it'll go through and it'll look for every actor and whichever one it finds first is the one that gets signed to be number zero um so that'll be a little tricky i'll have to test that out but currently right now red rings ideally maximum you should probably have is five minimum being zero obviously or one um the ui will not update correctly if you do not have five in the level so, 
Uh, you just have to figure that one out. I'm not sure. Uh, let's see here. Another basic actor we can go over. Oh, fans. Fans are pretty simple. Uh, you can set it to be active or inactive. Uh, you can set the scale, which will automatically scale it. Uh, you can set the radius, which is the radius of the, uh, the fan thing, as well as the fan half height. You can see how like tall it extends out. Uh, you can set it to override your X and Y or not, as well as the strength of it. Um, you can also tell whether or not it should interact with physics and whether it should uh, override the physics acceleration. So any physics objects or any objects that have a component inside that simulates physics, it will, uh, you can tell it to override its acceleration. Um, <clears throat> nice thing about fans is if your character has an air shield, if I bring on the air shield, air shield will allow you to ignore fans. Pretty neat. Fans are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, this here is the strength as well, like how fast it um, pushes you up. So if I increase that to 2000, you'll see it push me up much higher, or much quicker. Uh, yeah, that's about it for fans. There's not a whole lot to go over. Um, crates. Uh, crates are, uh, very unique in the fact that they're, so far, I believe, the only actor, or, like, stage object that has hit points. And the hit points do correlate to the actual hit points that your character can dish out. <laughs> <clears throat> so it says hitbox lifespan. I'm not sure what that means. I think that has to do with uh, how long the component, like the broken components stick around. I could be wrong though. So oh, cool. So what? The thing. It's really cool. We'll talk about it once you're done streaming. Oh, okay. What is this? You, you're the one that says this up. This hitbox lifespan. What does that do? What is that? Hitbox lifespan? Yeah, in the crates. For the crates? Um, I don't remember doing a hitbox lifespan because um, Emmanuel was the one sorting out all the hitbox stuff for me. Because it was to do with like the crates breaking and stuff. So, I, to be honest, can't answer that question because I don't believe it's something I worked on. Never mind. Anyway, you can set uh, the crates to be different types. Uh, different types. And they do have different properties depending on the one that you pick. Um, certain uh, crates by default. Uh, how's it going? Arianix? Is that how you pronounce that? I hope it is. How are you doing today? Collision is not properly set up to stand on them. Not sure why. That has to do with that piece of code I um, detached a long time ago to fix the shrinking bug. Ah, right. I still need to find a work around it. Yeah, I don't believe these exist in Colorful Combat, uh, so you don't have to worry about these. Um, I know the assets exist in Colorful Combat, but the crates themselves and how they interact in Colorful Combat is not the same as how they interact in the engine, currently right now. So, you know. Uh, swing pull. Swing pull is kind of the same as all the others. It has a launch destination and a launch uh, fail. A very unique thing about uh, swing pulls, however, is it actually has two destinations. Um, it has a failed destination and it has a success destination. Um, and this is all pre-calculated info. All this stuff uses the exact same information that the others do. So if I hit draw debug, you can see uh, it has two different debugs depending on uh, two different arcs depending on whether or not you succeed or whether or not you fail. We don't have all of this set up properly just yet. We still got to get the UI set up for this thing, um, but you can have a 
If you have a uh, pre-calculated off, um, it will do the same thing. Launch success strength, launch fail strength, meaning how hard it will launch you if you succeed versus how long, hard it will launch you if you fail. Um, input delay success and de delay fail. You can have two different input delays depending on if you succeed or if you fail. Uh, the rotation timer tick. Um, so if I overlap with this, you can see there is like false and true being uh, displayed up above. Um, whenever it says true, if I jump whenever it says true, I will succeed. If I jump whenever it says fail, I will fail. Whoop, like so. Did not launch me properly, but whatever. <clears throat> oh, um, it'll it'll launch you based on this arrow right here. Uh, if I increase the pitch, again, if the if precalculated is off, it will follow this arrow. So if I launch again. <laughs> You can see that time I launched upward because it followed the uh, tangent line of the arrow whenever it launched me. So if I set this almost straight upward, it will launch me much higher. Whoop, like so. And if I were to overlap with it, or if I were to jump whenever it says false, you can see I did not get anywhere near as good of a launch because fuck me, I guess I could. We could probably add an additional component, like a success arrow versus a failure a failure arrow, meaning the fail arrow would launch you in a different direction versus a success arrow would launch you in its own direction. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Like whenever you see how these components uh, interact with each other, it kind of makes a lot more sense. Um, <clears throat> we have link cannons right here. This doesn't do anything at the moment, so ignore that. Um, we have pulleys. Pulleys, uh, by the way, I'm going to go over the pulleys and the zip lines, but they don't function entirely how we want them to just yet. Uh, they are very, very close to being finished. Uh, input delay, your delayed input after you have finished uh, interacting with the pulley. A pulley length, you can change the length of the pulley here. Uh, reset delay, if uh, how long it takes before it resets itself. Um, should also probably add an option of whether or not you even want to be able to reset. Uh, the trigger box extent, that's this trigger box right here. Um, the extent, or whenever you overlap with it, it'll move you in, uh, attach you to the thing if you overlap with that uh, trigger box. There's also the hitbox extent, which you can't see, but it, it's basically the same as the other one. Uh, home attack cooldown, similarly to the um, spring if you home attack it there's a cooldown on how long until you can home attack it again uh there is the pulley interp speed and there's also the reset interp speed the reset interp speed dictates how quickly it's able to reset itself uh the pull speed dictates how fast it can pull you up so currently it's set to 1500 which is a pretty good default You can see it pulled me up there and you can see it also like went down much faster if i were to increase that it'd be really really fast like an insanely fast Oop. basically almost instantaneous but if i decrease that to 1000 which i believe it was set to 1500 by default it'll be much slower as you can see um <clears throat> the upward launch velocity as you can see whenever i reach the end i would get launched if i increase that you can see i got launched much higher that time and the input delay that's whenever i get launched there that's whenever the input delay would kick into effect um so yeah the pulleys are pretty self-explanatory um we have the zip lines the zip lines by the way are not complete um they are still uh under construction uh, the pulleys and the zip lines do not exist in colorful combat so if you're using the colorful combat update um they're not going to exist i like, don't expect this to exist yet uh let's see here we have with the zip lines they use a spline component that you can set however you want uh you can set the zip line interps 
uh, timer right here, as well as the uh, interrupt speed. I don't remember what all these do specifically. Let's look real quick. Okay, so yeah, the timer, I believe, has the timer been used anymore? Find references? No, timer's not used anymore, so ignore that. The interrupt speed is how long, uh, or how quickly you move along the zip line, similarly to the previous one. Boop. Like so. Uh, you can update the spline type to be linear if you want, and in order to do that, you have to hit update spline type. You can see it's now linear. Uh, even though there's a mesh that curves in between the two spline points, you do not follow the mesh. You actually follow the uh, the spline tangents. So if I were to hit this, you can see I kind of just went around at a very sharp angle. But if I were to update this to be curved and I were to update the spline point, you can see it follows a curve. Uh, you may have to grab the point and move it to adjust the mesh. Uh, it's kind of hard to see because of how sharp the curves are, but you can definitely tell that I didn't just zip from one point to another. I kind of curved around them a little bit. Um, you can tell whether or not you want it to reset or not. If you want, and if you don't want it to reset. And I interact with it. Uh, you can see it does not reset itself. But if I overlap with it again, I can uh, write it uh, on the way back. You're supposed to be able to home attack it again, but I don't know why I couldn't. But that's a separate problem. I'll have to figure out. Uh, zip lines are pretty self explanatory in that aspect. Uh, flamethrowers. There are multiple different types of flamethrowers there's fire electric and frost they will damage you unless you have a shield that matches its type so in this instance we have a flamethrower and we have a fire shield Oop, took damage the fire shield bam no damage uh there we same thing here if i swap it to electric set the shield to lightning take damage <laughs> grab electric shield no damage and the last one is ice or frost same thing uh if you grab an ice shield no damage a uh, unique thing about frost is if you hit it, you'll actually freeze in place. You can't move until it disables, in which case you'll not actually take damage, but you will break out of the ice. But if you have the ice shield, you can completely ignore these. Um, the only other thing you'll need to know is uh, these do interact with wisps. So for the flame shield, if I were to transform into burst, burst and I were to hit this, it actually, oh, come on. Like so if I were to hit it, it will actually launch me. It'll also refill my energy. So these can act like as an interesting little spring for wisps. Um, there's nothing for the frost, but uh, for electric, if I were to use ivory lightning instead, Lightning. You can see it launches Ivory Lightning as well. Boing, like so. And you can change the strength of that based on this here, this launch power, and you can override the X and Y if you want, similarly to a spring. <clears throat> uh, breakable walls. These are a little buggy at the moment. We implemented these a long time ago, and we have just never updated them. Uh, the thing about breakable walls, you have to set a speed in which they can be destroyed. Uh, so let's see, if I'm running here, 
You can see I broke right through that. I wasn't even boosting because the brake speed is so low that uh, it didn't really matter if I bumped this brake speed up to like 8,000. Even if I run at max speed while not boosting, uh, I will not break it because 8,000 is above the required boost uh, speed you can hit while not boosting. But if I boost, god damn it. Probably a bit too high. Well, I have to hit Mach 2. Damn it. Alright, let's let's not enough space for Mach 2 there. Alright, we've hit Mach 2. Bonk. Broke right through it. So yeah, that there is how those work. You can set it to break on stomp. Um You set it to break on stomp, it to my knowledge it will only break if you hit it while stomping. I don't think it'll check your speed. Um it doesn't always work. Sometimes it just straight up doesn't work. Uh and there's also only power, which checks to see if you are a power type character. Uh, I think power type characters by default can just break through it. No, okay. So power type characters will not be able to break through it by default unless you hit only power. In which case it will just break the moment it overlaps with the power character. So that's one way you can like um gate things for like certain types of characters. If you don't want to use a character gate, you could use this here to like gate things for power characters. A uh, crumble time, I don't remember what that does. I think that inter or that is what sets the uh um time dilation if I remember right. Could be wrong though. Real quick, I'm gonna order some food because I've not eaten today and I've been up for like two hours. Oofing. <clears throat> Is this something I can open on stream? Um, it's just something that they're working on. Mm. Essentially, they're working on documentation. So, uh, I was gonna talk to you about it once I'm done with the stream. I'll pop it open and it take looks really good. Pop it open and take a look. Ah. All right. Well, I will look at after this because I have to put in an email. I'm not I'm not about to put my email in on stream. Oh no, the second link you don't need an email for. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, I see. It they they haven't done much at the moment. They've they've done the set of the level and they've also got a section for providing starter content. Mm -hmm. Which is really cool. And they've done a bit for Unreal Engine 5 and it's all in French. <laughs> But the starting up levels in English. So maybe we can discuss with Octi about this documentation later on. Yeah. It's essentially just what I want to talk to you about. <clears throat> All right, my food has been ordered. Hopefully it won't take very long to get here. I'll have to look in that in a moment. Uh, um, so... We've hit about an hour and 50 minutes. I want to continue going. I want to try and get a couple more objects. I did not expect to take this long. I thought I would have been able to get a few more objects in. I, can't, I thought... I figured we would probably not be able to get to every object, like every stage object, but I was hoping to get through a few more than what I did. Um... <clears throat> Because there's an entire thing like buttons. That is an entire like its own thing. So uh, when it comes to things like buttons and barriers and stuff like that, uh, I will probably save that for next stream. Um, but 
two things I do want to get uh, done are grind rails. I would also like to get the water volume done, but I also want to get the the spline done. And I said I would do the spline because I was expecting a manual to be here today, but he is not due to prior engagements. And while I can go over the spline or the character splines, I don't know as much as a manual does, so I don't think I would be able to do it as much justice as a manual would. Give me a second. Just overall, I wouldn't be able to explain it as well as a manual. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll try it. Maybe we'll go over that, and then we will go over the water volume next time. Uh, because we had some people asking about the character spline. All right, so the grind rails. The grind rails are a spline. Uh, they are almost entirely just completely a spline component. If you don't know how to use splines, you are not going to know how to use grind rails. Um, I really kind of wish some of this stuff was not overlapping so much, so maybe here in a little bit, I might go in and change some of like the default positions of some of these components. That way, they're not overlapping where you first pull it out. Mm. Uh, if I remember right, this does exist in the Colorful Combat update. Um, something you absolutely have to make sure you do. A lot of people get confused on this. Um, you see this square, this giant square right here? This square is uh, the tracking square. The, this volume, what it does is it tracks the character's position and the character that overlaps with it. Um, <clears throat> the entire rail has to exist within this volume. If I extend this rail outside of the volume, and then I try to like grind on the rail, you're going to see that I'm going to fall off the rail uh, prematurely. So if I jump on the rail here... <laughs> Or not. It's supposed to. That's for the homing, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yeah, that, that's mainly for the homing attack. Um, the rail can extend outside of it, but any components of the rail that extend outside uh, of the volume cannot be overlapped in after, like, if you've not already overlapped with them, and you also cannot home attack on it. Uh, I can home attack anywhere on this rail right here, because it's inside of the volume. And I can jump onto the rail right here because it's inside of the volume. And I can stay on the rail, but I cannot or jump on the rail beyond that point. So if you want to be able to enter a rail at any point in time, that rail has to be encapsulated inside of this volume. And you can do so by simply grabbing the volume component right here and changing the extent. So if I stretch it out like so, oop, like that, I can then jump on the rail however I want. The volume... Oh, that's a problem. You can't actually spawn inside of the rail. You actually have to overlap with it. So let me pull forward a little bit. You can see now I can uh, track the rail at any point in time because now the entire rail exists within the volume and I can jump on the rail at any point in time. So... Right, let me shrink this down a little bit that way I can move it closer. No, I what the hell. Uh you can also move the component. Um as long as you have it selected here, you can move the component around however you feel. So uh position it how you need to in order to get the grind rail uh where you want it. Move this a little bit closer. Uh, so some more things about the grind rail. You can change the mesh right here. So if you want a different mesh, uh, what's the other mesh? There, there's a CGA um, mesh, isn't there? Yeah, I think if you just type in rail. Uh, green hill, green hill, green hill. I guess not. Oh wait, no, that's it. I think. Okay. Yeah. So if you want to change the mesh, that's how you do it right there. Um, we don't have any guards set up. Uh, I don't even know what the guards would look like. We've never actually tested them. 
That was from the original tutorial I got this from, Unreal. It yeah. told you how to set up guards for a racetrack. That's essentially the same code I'm using here. The guards are unnecessary, and I'll probably remove them. Yeah. A collision, this sets up a collision, like if the mesh has a collision or not. Um, you can also change the X and Y. Uh, you would only do that if, like depending on the properties of the mesh that you've imported. Uh, looping, that only really helps if it's... More than a more single than, point. Yeah, more than a single point. So if I pull this back, maybe move this over here, and pull it out another one, and I set to looping. Oh. I don't think we actually did set that up for rails. Ah, I mean, that makes sense. We could probably set it up, though. Um, draw track numbers. You just turn that off. It'll stop drawing the track numbers. So if you want those turned off, just boop, they're turned off. Um, so the launch force, I believe the launch force of a rail, let me double check here. I think the launch force of a rail is if you exit the rail, like whenever you exit the rail, I believe it launches you. Oh no. Okay. The launch force has to do with the homing attack. Should probably rename that. So if you home attack onto a rail, it has a launch force in which it will launch you along the rail. So like, as you can see, if I jump on the rail, I kind of just start at a default speed, but if I homing attack the rail, you can see I kind of launched at a higher speed. <clears throat> Assuming I'm not like completely parallel with the rail. Uh, that's what that launch force dictates. Uh, the character position height uh, that's what this capsule is. If I change it, I don't think it'll change in like an editor. It won't show up in editor. Uh, but that's where this posit like this little capsule here is positioned. Um, the max rail speed, how fast you can grind on a rail. Let me, let's just extend the entire collision box and let's extend the entire rail. So that way we have more to work with. Uh, detection collision. Extend this just a lot. A little bit higher as well. Um, pull it up that way I can back there. And then we will mess with the rail here. Whoop. So we just got a bunch of different rail components or uh, rail points here. The uh, max rail spe uh, speed here, uh, that's as fast as you can move on the rail while not boosting. Uh, and then there's a max rail speed while boosting. So the max speed you can move while boosting. Like so. Uh, changing these here will change the max speed. So if I made that 1500, I jumped on the rail, I'd be moving much slower. You can see I move much, much slower until I start boosting, in which case I can do that there. Uh, same thing with the boost, you can move that up and down if you want. Uh, the acceleration percentage, how fast it accelerates you to maximum speed. So from minimum speed to maximum speed, like if I jump on from a standstill, you can see I accelerate to the maximum speed. Uh, if I lower that 0.5, I think it would take longer to accelerate me. Yeah, you can see it took a lot longer to accelerate to the max speed. Uh, and then the same thing here, but for boosting, like it's a different one for boosting, how long it takes to accelerate to the max speed while you're boosting on the rail. A uh, minimum rail speed is the minimum amount of speed that you can go on a rail, as well as minimum rail speed for booster. Uh, rail speed modifier not sure what that does i think it has to do with your acceleration and max speed or something like that i have to talk to emmanuel about that one not sure you can change the grind rail sound so if you want to change the grind rails from something metal or stone to something maybe organic like tree bark or vines you would want you could change the grind rail uh sound effect that plays um some other properties you can spawn a grind rail booster, like this one right here. And then you can also select the booster 
and you can uh, move the booster along the rail based on this rail spine or rail spline location variable. <clears throat> the grand rail booster will uh, inherit the rotation of the spline automatically. Um, you can adjust the launch power, meaning how powerful it will launch you. Uh, so if I set this all the way near the beginning, like so, and I hit it and I overlap with it, it's going to launch me basically to maximum speed. So I didn't even have to like accelerate up to maximum speed. I just simply hit the rail and it like kind of just auto zoomed me. Uh, you can set the height offset, which if you have like certain types of meshes or something like that, I don't know, you would, might want to change the height offset. Uh, you can change its rotation. So you can tell it to like launch me in the opposite direction. Um, <clears throat> is rotate player well uh, with booster? If that is turned on and the rotation is set into the opposite direction, it should rotate you backwards. It doesn't, um, but that is a different bug. Uh, that's what that there does. As you can see, even though the rotation was off, um, is rotate player with booster. If I were uh, real grinding in the opposite direction of the booster, it would rotate me correctly, like so. If I turn that off, don't I think what it will do? Yeah, it'll just rotate me, or it'll boost me in the direction that it, that I'm moving rather than the rail is moving. Uh, this is currently bugged right now, um, but hopefully we can get it fixed relatively soon. Um, simply by pressing this button, you will spawn in the actor, but you can also technically move these actors on their own. I go to objects, grind rail booster, or those are the assets. The grind rail booster right here. If you want, what you can do is you can set a parent simply by doing that, and then it will correct itself like so. Um, that's another way you can add these. You can either pull it out and assign a parent, or you can select a spine and simply press a button to spawn in the actor. So there's two different ways you can do it. Uh, you can set these out and they can work independently. If you pull these out without a, um, without a, uh, grind rail having set it, you can set this to independent, meaning it will still launch you if you overlap with them. Kind of like that. They don't work very well, but um, if you wanted to, you could do that. Who is pinging me? Different people. Uh, the last thing you mainly need to know. Oh, here's a new thing that we have. This this is actually brand new. Let me pull out some stuff to prep for it. shield and wisp capsule you can now set a grind rail to be an ivory lightning grind rail if you do so the mesh will update to this thing right here which Mesh still has some issues with it, but I think Reese literally just imported it today, so it's uh, yes. not not perfect, but that's totally understandable. Uh, if you have a rail set to be an ivory lightning rail, the mesh will automatically update to an ivory lightning rail, and if you try to overlap with the ivory lightning rail, you will take damage. Unless, of course, one of two things happen. You have an electric shield equipped, in which case the ivory lightning rail will act like a regular rail. Or, you transform into Ivory Lightning. Lightning! In which case, Ivory Lightning will grind across the rail as if you were just Sonic. Lightning! Uh, there is a minor issue right there, as you saw, where uh, you can 
the the tracking gets all kinds of confused as to which actor is supposed to be tracking and stuff like that. It it's kind of weird. But um Lightning. Yeah, as you can see sometimes there's some issues with that. Lightning. Hopefully we can get that figured out, but in most instances it does work, uh in specific instances it doesn't work. Um but yeah. In order to set up an ivory lightning rail, you just pull out a regular grind rail and turn this boolean on, and it's suddenly a ivory lightning rail, meaning an ivory lightning wisp can overlap with it. Technically, an ivory lightning wisp can overlap with any rail. Um, like ivory lightning can lightning. use grind rails. It is the only wisp that can use grind rails. No other wisps can use grind rails. Ivory lightning is the only one. Um, but if you set it to be an ivory lightning rail, then the main difference between a regular rail and an ivory lightning rail is it will damage you if you are either one not ivory lightning or two you do not have a lightning shield equipped um there's also a separate spline camera for the rails uh like so this is a completely different component um the uh spline camera has its own properties that you can set I'm not very good at setting them. They like they're, they're kind of confusing to use. Um, what you can do is you can see that there's a little uh, vector widget here. This here is a look at location. So whenever you use a grind rail, you can or a grind rail camera, you can do one of two things. You can either or you do have to have this on this uh, spline camera. You can either tell it to watch the camera, which by default it does, or you can tell it to watch the location, which I don't know where that setting is at. Advance. Okay, if you have look at player here, so there's rotation, there's S cam look at uh, player, which is spline cam look at player. If you have that turned off, if you have it turned on, it will watch the player character uh, while they're on the grind rail. Like so. And the uh, spline will follow along, or the camera will follow along its spline automatically. Um, if you have that turned off, instead what it will do is whenever the player character overlaps with the rail, it will, it's supposed to look at the, uh, location but it clearly doesn't at the moment I have to talk to Emmanuel about that one it's he's the one that set it up um <clears throat> a whole bunch of different settings on the grand rail camera that i don't quite understand because i've never actually looked into it uh but if you understand anything about spline and cameras in like um interpreting and interpreting out things like that um it shouldn't be super difficult for you to pick up uh You have to excuse me, my blood sugar is dropping, meaning my ability to comprehend and think is also dropping. Oofing. Oh, I really should have eaten. But I did not. Uh, Go we get been... a graham cracker. So what? Go get a graham cracker. Get a graham cracker, yeah. That would be very beneficial. Indeed. Um... But yeah, I wanted to go over uh, character splines and spline pathing, but uh, I don't think I would be able to. I just I don't have the brain power. Um, <clears throat> next time we do a dev stream, it will probably be another tutorial stream, and we will be going over the water volume. We will be going over the character spline. Uh, and we will also be going over the switch interface. So things like buttons and switches and stuff. We've gone over most of all the stage objects. Um, I think the main one we didn't really go over were 
We didn't really go over warp rings, which are fine. I mean, we can go over warp rings next time. Falling platform doesn't really matter. We didn't go over the cannon, um, but a lot of what the cannon is is similarly to like the springs and stuff like that. Um, cannons kind of just do the same thing. I think the main difference between a cannon and a spring and a launch pad and stuff like that is cannons don't have a non pre calculated mode, uh, meaning they don't simply launch you at an angle. <clears throat> or they, they can't simply just launch you. Actually, I, I think they can, it's just we never really tested it. Um, yeah, launch power here. We we don't really use it. Cannons are best used if you have a pre calculated launch. Uh, we'll go over that next time, though. It It's not super complicated. Uh, we also didn't go over skydive volume. Skydiving volumes are super simple to my knowledge, um, if I remember right. Yeah, there isn't really any properties to a skydive volume. Um, you don't have to change any of the components with a skydive volume. All you got to do is make sure you don't spawn in the skydive volume. You can't spawn a player in the skydive volume. And you also have to make sure the end of the skydive volume is empty. Uh, we will probably add settings to add collision to it if you want. So that way you have to be confined within the skydive volume. Um, <clears throat> but skydive volumes are pretty simple for the most part. Does it show up in there? No, it does not. It's visible and hidden in game as often unless it's no that's weird yeah there we go i'm currently just overlapping with the period will put you into a skydive state um any character can skydive So yeah, skydive volumes are pretty simple. Uh, as long as you are able to exit one, you will not have any issues. Um, whether that be on the sides or the bottom, we will probably eventually add options to allow you to add collision to it so that way you can only enter the top and only exit the bottom. Uh, but we will see about that one. Uh, and then there's the death plane. Uh, the death plane is a death plane. You overlap with it, you die. Uh, that's that's kind of what a death plane is. Well, she wrote. <laughs> so yeah, if you want to know how to add a death plane, we literally already have one. It's it's a death plane. Uh, there's also other things like the spline camera, or the camera dynamic camera volume, the spline camera volume. There's also a character swapper which does not function entirely how we want it to just yet. Um, but that, that is a majority of the stage objects. Like, I feel like we've gotten a majority of them. We just don't have all of them yet. So we're, we're not planning on adding any more of them. Um, I don't even know if we're going to be really adding this link cannon. Maybe we will. I don't know. We'll have to see. Um, <clears throat> so that's. Uh, that's gonna be it uh, for this stream this step stream I'm gonna try and get it out as early as I can because it's another tutorial one meaning I got to like uh, I probably won't be editing it but I will be like you know putting a bunch of like timestamps and stuff in the in the description for it so um, our next dev stream will be on the 13th which is there something happening on the 13th? No. Okay. It's like next month is June. Yeah. When does Origins come out? Is that the 23rd? 23rd. Yeah, okay. I, I was off by 10 days. So yeah, the next dev stream will be on the 13th, uh, June 13th. 
Um, <clears throat> We've got news happening on the 7th and the 8th, or is it the 8th and the 9th for uh, Frontiers and Prime? You're talking about the Summer Games Fest? Yeah, and also Prime. Yeah. Uh, it's getting shown off the day before. Yeah. One of the, well, uh, I'll probably be going live for those, just like do a live reaction. Um, yeah. But that's not related to the dev stream stuff. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll be there for that, and obviously we're also going to be doing a live playthrough of uh, Origins on the twenty third. So yeah, this will will be live next for another dev stream on the thirteenth. The next uh, this will be uploaded as soon as possible. At the latest, it'll be the sixth, uh, but hopefully I'll be able to get it up earlier. Um, so if anyone has any questions you can like add them to the comments of the youtube video and uh, i'll try and go over them on the next dev stream whenever i see them so until next time we will be seeing everybody then and i hope you'll have a great rest of your evening bye